encouraged to see that there are positive signs from Council in the fact that uh, Council has agreed to a $2.1 million um, uh, capex uh, uh, from the 2019-2020 uh, budget to be carried over into the 2020-2021 financial year for the playground. So today we're actually presenting a check for a million dollars, and I think I had I had coffee with um, Councillor Sparrow yesterday, and he was he was quite surprised that there is um, that this is this could be the first time money has been given to the council instead of us coming <laughs> to ask you for money. So yes, it could be. Let's hope this is not the first, but we are actually uh, offering uh, or contributing our one million dollars from the society as confirmation of our committee's uh, commitment to the Garden of, Be of Beneficence and it satisfies our part of the agreement. Uh, we'd also like uh, Wellington City Council to reaffirm its commitment to undertake the works required for the garden to proceed. Uh, we also have the commitment of our sister cities uh, in terms of uh, contribution to the, the, the garden uh, in the form of uh, um, money and um, materials. So we leave the next steps in your good and safe hands. Namihi nui. And we'd like to present a cheque. Someone's taking our cheque. <laughs> Oh, um, so just just to um, help people with the process, the deputy mayor is going to receive the cheque on behalf of the mayor. Yes, and uh, and and, and uh, I think a lot of people don't even know what a cheque is. It's, it's, it's an old form of exchange or agreement, which doesn't involve in even. <laughs> I would um, actually like to invite um, Councillor Foon to accompany me to receive the cheque. Thank you. Um, where is the best way to do this? Oh, yes, okay. We're going to. Um, <laughs> photo. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, the um, Deputy Mayor will just say a few words in response. <laughs> so, um, thank you very much, David, um, Esther, um, Tina, and I'm very sorry, um, Harvey. Um, this has obviously been a really long process for both the Council and for the Chinese Garden Society, a Garden of Beneficence. Um, we do appreciate the fact that you've never let go of this vision and that you've got to the point where you can make this um, commitment to the million dollars. So we'll obviously be going away and having to have some, some more further discussions, um, both internally and I suspect externally, about how we can um, best work together to make this a reality. But thank you very much. This is obviously quite an important milestone for um, you and for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for coming in to present that and the hard mahi that's gone on um, in the background to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Right, now I'd like to invite Natalia Cleland from DCM.
um, who's going to come and talk to us at a service currently provided with ending homelessness. So welcome, Natalia. Um, and so you have um, 10 minutes, and there may be some time for questions. Would be good. Uh, I don't know that it is. Book. That, that's that on? on? Ah, maybe. Oh, kia ora, kia ora. thank you. Natalia Cleland, I'm one of the team leaders at DCM, which is Downtown Community Ministry. I think, Timothy, you've come to visit us um, once before, and um, our service is 50 years old. We've been in the inner city of Wellington for that long, um, working with the most marginalised, and our focus over the last maybe 15 years is around ending homelessness. So we're part of the Te Mahana strategy for the council. Um, and I'm just here to tell you about our amazing service. I'm not asking for anything. <laughs> I haven't got a check either. I should have bought a check. <laughs> um, I just want to, to uplift the council because you fund an outreach service, which is the service that I'm part of, which is an, a really effective service at meeting the needs of people who are rough sleeping and street begging in Wellington. And so, um, these figures aren't out yet, but last year we engaged with over a thousand people at DCM. Um, my team, which is the outreach team, um, engaged with over 400 people who were homeless. Um, that's just the outreach service. We followed up 243 notifications from concerned Wellingtonians. Um, and we conducted 653 outreach visits. So we're out there. We don't. We look like this, so people in the public don't really notice that we are a service. They might just think that we're a, a person passing by, but we are sitting down talking with people who are on the street. Right now, my team are out visiting people who are rough sleeping in um, Cuba Street, and, and, and there's a, a car and tower which we're following up. <laughs> um, and we're proactive and persistent, so people might say to us, oh, no, thank you, go away, and we might go away then, but we'll come back, and we'll come back, and we'll come back. And we've got some really cool stories about um, successes in that. So um, we, at DCM, we have a dental service, we have a volunteer physio, audiologist, ophthalmologist, um, we have Teatro Health who run uh, clinics there three mornings a week. We, have, we had 101 people come and vote through um, a polling booth that we had, which was amazing, yeah. And that's people that have never voted before. That's guys who have been in prison every time that there's an election or have actually thought, what's the point? My voice doesn't matter. And for the last kind of month, we've been talking about what it means to have a voice. What are the referendum about? And trying to get people informed. And that's just an amazing outcome to have people um, have, have a say in that way. Um, and we're we're a hub for people. So during the during the morning, people come and have a coffee and something to eat, and then see a social worker. And it might just be a matter of me sitting there like this, like this, chatting with people without any kind of pressure, and then finding out that there's something going on and and being able to work with them. So. DCM is a great service. We've got an outreach service, which is my team, seeing people who are rough sleeping, getting them engaged either on the street or inviting them in to come and have a coffee. Um, we've got the Housing First service now, which is a year old, and that's that real intense wraparound support for people who um, wouldn't be able to sustain a tenancy without sort of at least once a week social worker visiting. Um, and then we've got the Sustaining Tenancy Service, which actually Wellington City Council uh, fund a part of. So that service had uh, worked with 23 vulnerable city housing tenants last year, and all of them sustained their tenancy. So it's a really successful contract, which, which you guys fund. So I'm just wanting to say thank you. We're, we're doing good work with the money that you're giving us. And... Um, and, and uh, the number of tomai that we're seeing, tomai is what we refer to our clients, the number that we see coming through the door, um, it kind of tells us that we're an effective service. I know that might sound strange, but it, it shows people, shows us that they're wanting to work with us. I just want to tell you about one really amazing example, and then hopefully if there's um, some questions, there's time for that. There was a guy who was rough sleeping. He was hidden. We, ne we never saw him. No one really ever saw him. He was rough sleeping kind of around here for about five years. And a property owner found him because they wanted to develop the property and told us, and we went out several times, couldn't find him, saw his site, very well set up, um, but had to do a few early mornings because he was only there in the morning. He had no ID, no bank account, no benefit, actually didn't even know his last name. <clears throat> um, 
we within about three weeks got him into some emergency accommodation. We got him uh, some ID so that he could get a bank account, so that he could get on a benefit, so that he could get on the social housing wait list and then on city housing wait list. So within about maybe three or four weeks, he'd gone from rough sleeping, unknown, to in a home, well, in some emergency accommodation with a roof over his head, with some income, with a bit of hope. And he's now got a part-time job. It's amazing. So when people tell us we'll go and then we'll, you know, that's a great success, but we'll, we'll work with people on what's going on right from nothing to something. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great example of the work that we do. And we would invite people to come and, and see us some morning, mornings because it's a really vibrant um, a place to be. And, yeah, that's, that's all I've got to say. Are there any questions? Uh, kia ora. Yeah, I do have a, um, a partai. Um, so I know that you've done a little bit of work in Tawa over the last few years. We've had a few um, situations with people homeless yes. in Tawa. And I'm just wondering what you do with working um, around the region, because for some of those people, they are actually put into a base, but they were yes. coming to Tawa, and how you work in with other services and how that yeah. support network works. We... Um, I'll speak about Porirua in a minute, but the so the Lower Hutt um, City Council doesn't have an outreach service like us, but our Housing First service, which is funded by HUD, are now in the hut at Kōkiri Marae. So um, one of my team members, Robert, is actually now the team leader for that service. So they will, will be providing the Housing First service, which has a component of outreach. Um, that's not funded, but they, they do that work out in Lower Hutt. Porirua is an interesting one because of it's not such a black and white border and um, we we have had examples of people who sort of have a toe in Tawa and in Porirua and we actually still work with them. We've connected with the um, Porirua Police and the, Ta and the Wellington Police and the Porirua City Council and the Wellington City Council um, safety team and, and have had done, uh, done some sort of MDTs about people who are sort of moving between those spaces. And actually, um, our sustaining tenancies team through uh, DCM have just sort of started to have some community um, engagement out in Porirua very early days. But um, and actually, we've got a we're starting to do some community um, engagement out in some of the um, in Centennial Flats. <clears throat> in Berenport to try and bring DCM out to where people live to help people who are in their tenancies stop coming into town but find some community with their neighbours and in their, in their suburbs. So that's also early days. Fantastic. Thank you. We've got a partai from Councillor Young. Yes. So some of us have a long uh, relationship with the DCM um, and of course the wonderful donation from Morris Clark which made that building possible. Yes. So just uh, two totally different questions. One is, will the upgrading of the buildings by the Wellington Company, is it Trojan House, etc., at the top of Luke's Lane, have any effect on you? I don't know. We're waiting to see. I mean, we'd love that have, to have been social housing, but I don't think it's going to be. Um, we we have very interesting neighbours, lots of businesses, and we try and include them in what we do because we know that actually some of our Tomai are not necessarily the best neighbours to have. So, yeah, I don't know how to answer that really. I'll wait and see. We would have loved to, for it to have been homes for um, vulnerable people, but so 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 next one totally unconnected yeah. uh, is the book fair. Yes. So, so, I mean, um, the books, I think, are still in storage at Shelley Bay? Hopefully not. I think we'd moved them. <laughs> oh, so you found another storage? Well, place. I think what had happened is um, it's all sort of been moved to various places and some stuff that we'd had stored is sold and, and it's all moved out. We'd actually, um, we didn't do the book fair this year, obviously, um, but... And, I, and I'm not sure if we'll be doing it in the future. I, I don't know. But I don't think that we've still got stuff at Shelley Bay, but I can check that. No, it's more about the um, ongoing future of the book. Yeah, Plus, yeah. I mean, apart from the fact it's a great way for councillors to get their photographs of Facebook, yeah. uh, it's also a really great asset for the book reading community at Wellington. Yeah, yeah. yeah. OK, yeah. thank you. Uh, well, have a, one last part away from Councillor O'Neill. Kia ora. thank you so much for your um, your amazing work and all the wonderful updates that you sent through as well. I was wondering if you could talk a wee bit about um, what changed in homelessness over lockdown and how yeah. some of those journeys and services to support 
um, were impacted with, yeah. with lockdown and what services you need going forward. Lots of people moved into emergency accommodation, so it looked like we'd solve the problem around homelessness. We haven't. Those people still meet the New Zealand definition of homelessness. Um, and uh, just recently, the um, MSD started bringing in a 25% income-related rent charge for people in emergency accommodation. We think that's great because there's a barrier for people. If they're in free accommodation, when they're then offered a permanent home and they go from free to paying rent, that's something that will prevent them from taking that up. So I know that doesn't really answer that question. I'm, I'm sort of out of time, but there are people who have moved off the street um, to some respect and are still waiting for permanent housing and, um, and we're still working with them it, it, almost like in a housing first approach, we're seeing people weekly to support them, but yeah. Um, ngā mihi maoha, um, kia koe, Natalia, thank you so much thank for you. coming and supporting all of us today. Come and visit any time. <laughs> yeah, that sounds lovely, thank you. Uh, right, I'd like to welcome um, Haman Maron um, from Maron Applied Sciences. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, on Zoom. Oh, yes. Morena Ham, Haman. Um, so Haman's going to talk to us about sewage sludge minimisation, item 3.1. And so Haman, you've got uh, 10 minutes, but there may be some questions. So if you want to leave a little bit of time within that for questions, that'd be great. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Morena, everyone. Kia ora, tenakoto. My name is Herman Madden, and I am an Edmund Hillary Fellow. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity today to present before the council our proprietary solution for sewage sludge management. Uh, is my presentation on the screen, please? Yes, it is. Yes. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, I don't have control of the slide, so uh, if someone could help me with that, I would be grateful. Yes, so if you just say next when you want it to change to the next slide. Yes, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so part of what I'm seeking to do essentially is to develop solutions such that uh, humanity can transition from linear consumer consumption models uh, towards a more circular economy. One of the things that we've been working on for uh, the past four years is methods and processes to valorize fecal sludge. This is both uh, abundant and perennial. It's also a significant challenge, not just in New Zealand, but, but all over the world. Our focus obviously has been able to develop a solution that is cost-effective and ecologically sustainable. Those are the primary considerations for us to develop uh, a viable solution. May we have the next slide, please? I've been a mechanical engineer. I have a background in automobile engineering and uh, my partner and colleague who's also an Edmund Hillary Fellow uh, has a background in finance. Along with the two of us, uh, we have Dr. Mate, who's our technical advisor. He's also a guide and a mentor. Uh, and he's an alumnus of the Colorado State University and over the course of his career has uh, 35 patents to his name globally. So that's a little bit about our background, about who we are. In the brief time that uh, I've had the pleasure of being uh, in New Zealand earlier, we also have a non-disclosure agreement that we've signed with the Victoria University of Wellington uh, with their sustainability department. And uh, I hope that also serves to uh, give us a little bit of credibility in terms of the context of what we're trying to achieve. Um, the next slide, please. There are several benefits that could potentially accrue to the Wellington City Council if it were to consider adopting our approach. Primarily amongst these, of course, is uh, the opportunity to have zero waste going to landfill and zero liquid discharge. It's also, like I said at the start, a solution that can be achieved uh, for a relatively modest capital outlay. More importantly, I think this aligns really well with the culture of innovation in New Zealand and would also help to position uh, Wellington City as a pioneer. May we have the next slide, please? I'll talk a little bit about how this process works. Uh, if you all can just recall primary level, school, primary school science that we all studied, 
consider this system as something akin uh, to mechanical recreation of a cow's gut. So just like a cow has a, a multi-chambered stomach, we use multi-phase digestion. The <clears throat> sludge is co-digested along with other forms of green waste. This could be food scraps from canteens and restaurants. This could be food that's passed at sell-by date in supermarkets. It could include grass clippings. These are then mixed with the sludge in a proportion uh, that determines the best yield of gas or energy that can be recovered from the process. So that's the first part of our IP. <clears throat> These, uh, this mixture then moves through the digestive system and uh, it, it's a biotech process. The breakdown of the organic matter happens naturally and uh, produces both biogas and a digestate, which is a very high quality, nutrient rich and pathogen free fertilizer. This can be used to supplement or even substitute the use of uh, chemical fertilizer. Very significant in the New Zealand context, considering its uh, imports of uh, chemical fertilizers. May we move to the next slide, please? In terms of a timeline, we are seeking to pursue this opportunity in two stages. First, obviously, we would look to build uh, the first plant at uh, the Karori West Water Treatment Plant. <clears throat> This plant has a capacity to process approximately two and a half tons of sludge every day. We expect that we could operationalize this plant within a period of 12 months and uh, thereafter move to developing the systems uh, for the larger plant based at Moor Point. The energy recovery would be significant from the Moor Point facility. This can be used uh, in several ways. It can be used to offset the energy needs of the Moor Point facility. Alternatively, it could be uh, the energy could be fed into uh, the grid locally, which can then be used to charge up to 480 electric vehicles every day. There's also the opportunity for us to upgrade this biogas to bio CNG, which is chemically identical to natural gas and inject it into a reticulated gas grid. May we have the next slide, please? The input and output forecasts are here before you. I'd also like to stress the point here that uh, such a solution will be able to achieve carbon payback within a period of three years. When I say carbon payback, I mean that we could account for the carbon that it would take for us uh, or the kind of emissions that we would have carried forward in terms of uh, the construction, including the use of materials such as cement, concrete, steel, etc and that this offset could be achieved within a period of three years. Going forward over the life of the plant, this, this system would actually be carbon negative, thereby contributing in its own small way towards New Zealand transitioning to being a zero carbon economy. Um, may we have the next slide, please? I'd like to stress here that the cost that we indicated in, in uh, the slide prior to this does not include the cost of the land. So that is a factor. The costs that we estimate are for the equipment and machinery, fabrication, construction, et cetera. <clears throat> also the kind of operational structure that the council would choose would then determine the kind of co commercial arrangements that would be possible. Um, I foresee three potential types of uh, commercial structures these could be uh, either an EPC or an engineering procurement and construction sort of a contract, in which case we build the facility for Wellington City Council, but the facility is owned and operated by the council. We provide maintenance and support services. Alternatively, there can be a hybrid annuity model uh, kind of a structure. And this, the capital outlay for the council is smaller and is in a cadence which could be either monthly or quarterly and is then uh, paid to us over the course of the operation of the, of the facility, which could be 20 or 25 years. Uh, but the council is, will not have to put in a large sum of money up front to build the plant. The third option, which I feel is also an innovative uh, possibility, is to enter into some sort of a joint venture uh, with the council and our company to create a public-private partnership. Uh, this is interesting. It's, it's novel. It's uh, an approach which is, I think, 
very important in the context of providing effective public services because uh, over a period of time, there would be revenues that would accrue and these could be paid as an annual dividend or an annuity to the council, which could then in turn be used to subsidize other public services. So this is a little bit about the proposed solution and overview in terms of uh, who we are, the technology, uh, how we propose to proceed. And I would like to thank this August audience once again for this opportunity and a special heartfelt thank you to Councillor Laurie Foon for, for having had us uh, present here today. I'm happy to take any questions, please. Uh, thank you. We do have one question from Councillor Rush. Thanks, Harmon. Um, just, just to, not really a question, but just to say that um, that, that Harmon's technology is on the radar of Wellington Water and has not been discounted, and uh, we will be discussing it at, the, at, a, at a workshop later in the year. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you thank you. That's very helpful, Harmon. Um, you've done a lot of work there um, thinking about that, and thank you for explaining it to us. We appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. What's that, sorry? Oh, have you got, oh, sorry. Are you, oh, he's gone. Oh, no, I'm, so, I'm still here. Yeah, Good. Um, yes, yes, sorry, yes. we do have a question from Councillor Foon. Oh, no, sorry. Yes, please. Councillor Free. I just wondered if you had questions. <laughs> no, no, they generally indicate. <laughs> Councillor Foon will make a question. Thank you. Partai. Um, and just maybe one, one question we've got. Um, you know, options on the table, and I guess just with my sense, my practical self, I, I see that we've got a few uh, options coming forward to us today, and you've presented two ideas, one around the smaller amount of sludge coming from Karori, and, you know, then we've got the bigger amount at Moa Point. But if we were looking at, at the smaller amount it does mean setting up two systems. So what what would you say to what would be in our interest to do that? Uh, that's an excellent question, uh, Councillor. I think by phasing this in, in two stages, it allows us to arrive at a certain degree of uh, uh, competency and ensure that we get it first time right. Uh, and to do so with a limited or a nominal capital outlay in, in the first stage, which is just a million dollars. And as you're aware, we've we've also spoken with MFE and ECA as well to potentially qualify for a grant to build that facility. So I think that's that's the intent really, so that we're able to refine it and optimize it in the context of what needs to be done uh, uh, you know, for the sludge that's available locally. I'd like to stress here that this sort of a digestive system is a living system. And it has to be fine-tuned specific to the type of sludge, the little bit of seasonal variability that we see in, uh, in the sludge uh, chemical characteristics, which is an outcome of the diet, which in turn is, is an outcome of uh, what's being grown and consumed locally. So that is the reason why we'd, we'd seek to do it in two phases. Kia ora, thank you. Um, so we've run out of time now for more questions, but thank you, Harman, for answering that question. Appreciate that. Uh, just to confirm, councillors, it's not the microphones interacting that causes that sound. It's some connection that no one's managed to find. But yeah, it's been thoroughly tested. <laughs> but it's very random as to how it happens and um, doesn't. Uh, I'd like to invite um, Hannah and Liam from the Rubbish Trip to come and talk to us about item 3.1, the sewage, sewage sludge minimisation paper. Um, welcome, and so uh, you guys have 10 minutes as well, and you've got a presentation? Yep, great. So 10 minutes, and I imagine there could be some questions, so if you're able to give us a little bit of time for that, that would be great. Thank you. So it's working. Uh, I'm going to be doing the presentation, but um, Hannah's here to, to answer any questions as well. Um, but uh, kia ora, I'm uh, Liam, Hannah, we are the Rubbish Trip, so um, we're a zero waste um, education organisation and we've been travelling all over New Zealand for the past three years um, giving presentations about how people can reduce their household rubbish. Um, and it's all based on our own experience of living without a rubbish bin for um, nearly six years now. Uh, but, but however, there is one waste stream we haven't been able to eliminate from landfill and that is our own poo. Uh, so 
Um, last week, Wellington Water um, proposed a, a whole range of options for dealing with sewage sludge, and as you're probably aware, it's very connected to the landfill extension issue as well. Um, and we're totally on board with reducing and ultimately removing sludge from the landfill. Um, but I think it's important to say all of the proposed options on the table are what you might call um, bottom of the pipe solutions um, and that they tack on an extra process to um, a, a system which has a lot of problems in itself. So today we're going to focus on the, the human waste and flush toilet side of the equation. We want to make the case for council uh, to consider decentralised source separated or top of the pipe solutions um, to human waste, to sewage, to wastewater and the long-term strategic planning. Um, and this is alongside whatever council decides to do with the sludge. Um, so we're not talking about doing away with the current system now, but making space for considering um, and trialing an entirely different model um, that you know may reshape the way that as a city we, we do sanitation going forward in the future. So if we don't start now, we, we sort of feel like like we might end up in a very messy situation in the future. So what is a decentralized system? It can be as simple as a um, compost toilet bucket with a toilet seat on top, but there is actually a lot of innovation in this area. There are lots of different systems and models for different populations, um, different uh, different situations, different separations of waste stream and processing them. I'm not going to go through the details of those. We want to just focus on some of the um, broader advantages of a decentralized system compared to the, to the current system. So first of all, um, in a flush toilet system, Human waste goes, it's flushed away and it gets mixed with everything else that is in the sewage system. Um, and at the end, you end up with a very contaminated sludge. So it's all of the heavy metals, all of the industrial chemicals, and, and very concerningly, lots of microplastics as well um, that, that contaminate the sludge. And you know, if the aim is to remove the sludge from landfill and find another use for it, for example, applying it to land, then we really need to, to take into account um, there are some pretty frightening studies out there coming out about um, soil and agricultural soils being contaminated by uh, microplastics and other pollutants from the application of biosolids. So um, it's, it's a very quite alarming um, situation and, and the consequences are really unknown. On the other hand, composting toilets, they keep human waste separated and therefore uncontaminated, aside from pharmaceuticals, which, are, which is something to, to keep in mind, but they do rescue the val valuable nutrients and allow them to be used for fertilizing and replenishing soils. Secondly, um, sewage and sanitation is a really big resilience issue, of course. Um, so, for example, with, with um, a disaster situation like an earthquake, which could totally wipe out Wellington's sewage system, um, but also in, in terms of water insecurity that we might face um, in, with a changing climate. So the current sewage system is very water intensive and it contaminates a large amount of potable water. Um, and the, pr the pressure on the system is only going to get um, worse in the coming years and decades. So um, comp composting toilets, um, which are sometimes called dry toilets as well, they don't use water at all. So um, this means they can function well in the disaster scenario um, where the water infrastructure might be damaged. And also they can help preserve um, water in times of water scarcity and, and save that water for essential use. Um, you might be aware of the Wellington Regional Emergency Management Office trial that, um, of emergency composting toilets in 2013. It was a really successful trial, proved that composting toilets could work well in an emergency scenario in Wellington. Um, and we would like to see this going forward. It doesn't seem that there's been much kind of um, done with this so far. Um, thirdly, the current, uh, the, the costs, of course, you know, all, all of the proposed options are, are expensive, but uh, not only that, but you know, it doesn't address the increasing costs of maintaining, repairing, replacing uh, the pipes and infrastructure of the current system. Um, and that's not even taken into account an earthquake scenario, really complicating things. Um, Decentralized systems will, of course, still require investment, um, but it's a far more resilient system. And so, and also, if there is sufficient uptake over time, then it can take pressure off the current um, system. If we don't kind of consider both things, then we run the risk of sort of a lock-in effect of sticking with this um, this current system, which could cause a lot of problems in the future. So, so those are sort of some of the key benefits we see see to this to a decentralized system. And again, it's something that can be implemented over time alongside whatever the council decides to do with the current sludge um, issue. 
Now, we're not pretending that it's going to be plain sailing to, to make this happen. It is a, you know, a, a very, very different system that most developed cities around the world um, you know, uh, aren't doing. We're, we're all doing this, this uh, centralized system. Uh, there are sort of, uh, there are three key barriers in New Zealand to actually making this, this work um, that need to be worked through. Firstly, there's the building code, which requires mandatory connection to water mains um, for toilets. That doesn't uh, mean to say you can't have a composting toilet as a secondary option, but it still does raise some challenges for new builds and things like that. There are genuine public health concerns, um, particularly in terms of ensuring that um, disease-causing pathogens are properly eliminated by the composting process. Um, but there are some really good safe guidelines around that. Uh, there's, a, there's an Australian New Zealand official standard around how, um, how that can work properly. There are also tikanga issues as well around um, how and where to dispose of the compost. Um, and there's also public perception that it's just a little bit gross to deal with your own waste. Um, but, you know, with good uh, public information campaigns, um, you know, and if anyone's actually used a composting toilet that works well, you know, it doesn't smell, uh, it's not sticky and gross. So um, on top of those three issues, there's also um, the Wellington Regional Council's um, proposed natural resource plan, which does permit composting toilets, but, um, but it does require the effluent to stay on site. So that does kind of raise barriers around if there was to be collection and, and off-site treatment of, of, the, of the waste. So just to finish off, um, you know, we at the Rubbish Trip um, and many others working in sustainability and waste minimization in Wellington are really keen on seeing some sort of um, pilot project to, to test this again in, in urban Wellington, maybe um, off the back of the emergency um, trial by Remo. Um, and that might look like, at the first stage of that might look like a funded research or feasibility study to work through those barriers um, that I mentioned and, and find the safest and most workable solutions. But also just to say there is a lot of, of interest um, uh, and, and increasing interest in this uh, in research globally, um, really um, trying to find ways of, of creating a sanitation system that is not only environment uh, not only environmentally not damaging but environmentally beneficial, but also very resilient and in the long term could could um, be much more cost effective than the current system. So thank you. Kia ora, thank you for that. Um, Councillor Pennant has a pathway. Thank you so much for coming in, and you've got so much expertise, that's really appreciated. Um, so you said really there's no one doing this on a city-wide basis, and I'm just curious around if you've done any or seen anything around costs to implement, because obviously these costs of the conventional systems are very high, but they wouldn't, it wouldn't be free. No. Um, yeah, I mean, you're right. The, the trials that have been done have been very limited sort of focused on, you know, one apartment block or one, one building. So, yeah, there isn't really the, the, uh, the expertise on how, how you could scale that out. Um, but I think it's probably, uh, there's, an, there's a, a, an argument for sort of economies of scale that if, if there was a, a system that could work, um, you know, that was trialled to work, that could be, could be scaled out and sort of bring, bring costs down. But, yeah, again, it's because it's such a sort of new and untested technology that, yeah, it's not really known. I think that's probably one of the reasons why there is a, quite a need for a feasibility study to start to look at, to have the space and the time to look at what has been trialled overseas, look at it in more depth, and bring in experts in this area, for example, engineers, systems engineers, and public health professionals, and have a little bit of a go at what could be scaled and standardised and then cost it. But it's very difficult in the, with the current status quo to, to have the space and the resources to really explore these alternative options um, to answer questions like cost as well as practice things so um, it is sorely needed because the longer we put it off it sort of never gets answered yeah yeah maybe there's an easy way to trial some of the decentralization through like drinking water rather than yeah around the wastewater so we'll discuss that uh Hepata, councillor Foon, can you be quick <laughs> uh, just just a quick idea of understanding how many composting toilets are actually existing in New Zealand already? And also, is there a bit of a synopsis after what came out of Christchurch um, after the earthquake? Yeah, in terms of um, composting toilets around New Zealand, that would be a very interesting study. We certainly, on the rubbish trip, we stayed with a lot of people with composting toilets. Um, so it's very common as soon as you get 
outside of cities. Um, so, yeah, it would be very interesting and fascinating to do that study. I don't think, think there has, but Christchurch had a, a, quite a difficult experience um, with toileting because they went down the Portaloo Road, um, which is sort of contaminated sludge, but next level. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, the composting toilets were sort of introduced... Um, soon after the, the earthquake, um, but I don't know if there's been much of an uptake or, or sort of exploration of that as a as an ongoing thing. Yeah, and again, all of the all of the things in New Zealand. The, the only urban um, a, a example of a composting toilet in, in New Zealand I'm aware of is um, Sustainable Coastlines in Auckland. The flagship has a composting, and I don't know how that works, um, but it would be an interesting example to look into. It would be great to have the space and the time and the resources to really look into it in more depth because I think you'd probably uncover quite interesting and novel, innovative models, yeah. Okay. Oh, kia ora kōrua. Thank you so kia much ora. for taking the time to Thank share you. something different with us. We appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome um, Angela and Ali from um, Ōwhero Bay Residents Association who are also coming to speak to us about item 3.1. And so you um, have 10 minutes, and there could be some questions within that time if you've got a bit of, bit of time left over. Thank you. I'm not sure if your microphone's on, sorry. Thank so you, it's just got the green light. Um, oh, well, you probably heard that. We're addressing the sewage sludge minimisation paper as well. Um, so as residents of Ophira Bay and Wellington, we're looking for an integrated approach to waste. We, we'd like to see joined up thinking and a regional strategy for the whole waste cycle. A forward looking capital city must lead the way. Um, and we should change our thinking and treat waste as a resource rather than just something, a problem to dump. Only the less developed cities of the world are still burying sewage in landfill. Um, so we should be leading, not following 30 years behind the EU. Ophira Bay's immediate concern has been the southern landfill extension, but intimately linked with that is, is the problem of sewage sludge, as we all know, which is why we're here. In April, um, we were pushing the for the council to pause in its pursuit of the resource consent for an extension to the southern landfill. Um, we could see that until the, the issue of sewage sludge was addressed, the application shouldn't be made because no reduction in waste was desirable or possible um, while it was required for burying sewage sludge in the landfill. Um, so we wanted the council to wait for the sludge options paper from Wellington Water before deciding on the landfill extension. And so we're very pleased to see that, that that's been done. Um, so uh, our community wants this process to be transparent to the public. The options paper tabled here is, is very light on detail and it raises a huge number of questions. We want to see all the background data, including the concept design report cited in the document. Um, and when it's done, the independent review by council officers and anything that comes up during the course of council deliberations. The community should be involved in the process, not just consulted in February with the chosen option. And this consultation should not be subsumed into the LTP. Um, it needs to be done separately or it'll just get lost. The proposed solution in this paper is, is a great improvement on just burying most of the biosolids bio as it is now, but it's only part of the picture. It still relies on, on dumping sewage as before. Um, we'd like to see joined up thinking and a regional strategy for the whole waste cycle. We don't want resources dumped um, and we want Wellington Water, Wellington Council and the regional council working together. The sludge solution is going to be costly, what, whatever one is chosen. Um, the selected option here may not be fully operational for possibly 15 to 20 years. Um, we hope a lot less. We don't want to find that it's obsolete before it even starts. So um, this is a hugely important decision for Wellington and one that we think will show whether Wellington is a truly forward-looking capital city that the rest of the country can use as a benchmark. Um, and I'll hand over to Angela. For... Kia ora, thank you. Um, can we have the next slide, please? So um, I just want to put, uh, show an um, a, a image of the... That one. 
that's the um, view of Wellington from the sky. Um, no other suburb is scarred and contaminated like Ofido Bay. As you can see, the three white points there are our landfill. And you'll probably notice that the only other white bits in this picture are buildings. Um, this is a view from space, and um, yeah, the landfill is the dominant feature. So the sewage um, sludge in the landfill was promised to be a temporary measure. It was only going to last for months. It's actually lasted for 12 years. The original plan was to turn the sludge into compost, and the scheme was stopped in 2009 for a few months while new technologies were developed. And this plant um, capability is currently mothballed um, on site. Wellington City has a limited waste minimisation um, program, and we believe this is because of the need to bury the sludge. The closure of other uh, landfills in the wider Wellington, Wellington region is of concern to us, and because this means that the southern landfill will become increasingly the regional uh, waste centre. Uh, we recently, or Whera Bay recently had an e-petition. Um, it had wide community interest. We got 381 signatures, and people were signing up to stop burying the sewage sludge at the landfill. The option paper perpetuates um, system failures, and it doesn't address the basic needs. Uh, we believe that the process is wrong. The elephants at the table have not been addressed. That is the sewage. Uh, the landfill remains our sewage sludge cemetery. The proposal is a retrograde step in the eyes of many residents. The um, funding um, is not addressed. Waste minimisation, innovation. What happens when the sludge exceeds permitted amount um, that's being consented has also not been assessed. And uh, also, what happens to the land afterwards? You know, huge issues. We've got some really great ideas that we can help you with that. Um, Ofeta Bay residents are concerned. Um, the preferred option presented is an option, not options, and there's much missing data. Um, what we have now is inadequate, outdated, and broken. It is at least 100 years old, and at the time it was state of the art and has yielded the council long-term gains and cost benefits to the point that a lack of investment has been enabled. We want you to think about sustainability. We want you to think about the long-term solution. We also uh, feel that um, Ofeta Bay's contamination is, has been compounded by seven failures of uh, many government agencies. Um, of which Wellington City Council's um, pumping sewage into the landfill when the original business case said that this was only a temporary solution is one of the issues that has um, prov provided an issue for our community. So what do we want? We want a leading edge plan for the uh, sludge minimisation and waste reduction. We want a long term solution. We want that to have a lead, we want to be a leader in environmental management and recycling. Um, we want the solution to um, live with Wellington's brand of being an innovative and livable city. Uh, we also want commitment at the community level. We want strategies to be innovative at the landfill, options to be appropriate for Wellington and also balancing technology with practical, appropriate, scalable technology. We're not asking much. So what we re also want is a fully circular, resilient system that is low carbon emitting and protects our unique ecosystem. We also want the southern uh, coast to be celebrated and protected. We believe the paper does not do this. It maintains the South Coast as Wellington's dirty little secret. Um, it does not protect our local Tonga, the stream and the marine reserve. We also want to work with the Council in meaningful ways to achieve solutions that protect our ecosystems. Kia ora. Kia ora. Are there any Pātai councillors? Uh, Councillor Fitzsimons, you haven't asked a question yet. Um, well, first of all, thank you for all the work that you do. Um, I'm very interested in your comment that you want to be more involved before the LTP and that you want, you know, that, that genuine kind of consultation and actually 
kind of being at the table. Have you got any suggestions about how that would work in practice um, before before one July yeah. next year? <laughs> council and indeed um, the um, partners that you have contracted to provide solutions um, need to um, have a co-design approach. They need to recognise that our local community, we have um, expertise and that needs to be invited to the table sooner rather than later. And um, we also believe that if the solution is co-designed with the community, because there are other partners um, apart from Orfido Bay, but we would be the prime ones, of course. Um, you know, is that there will be a sustainable um, solution long term. Yeah, yeah. Kia ora, Councillor Pennant. Um, thank you so much, and all your aspirations <coughs> are amazing. Are you sort of, as a community, prepared to pay the cost? Because the whatever solution or solutions that are chosen, the cost keeps going up and up and up. So do you think there is um, a commitment to doing that? What, what do you mean by paying the cost? Mon the money. The money to make all this happen. If we're going to have, have a circular economy and, and, we, and we deal with the sewage, which we need to. We wouldn't be expecting to pay more than, than the rest of Wellington. I, I just meant, do you think your community as part of the city would be prepared to pay? Yeah. Sometimes you have to spend money to save money. Um, and we do appreciate that the council is really up against the wall, as is the rest of um, the government. And... Um, New Zealand because of the unique characteristics that COVID has provided on top of our infrastructure imploding on us. Um, uh, you know, the re reality is that it will cost money. Um, hopefully there will be a minimal flow and effect through rates, but you know, the reality is that um, the long-term gain will create some short-term pain. Kia ora, ngā mahi maiohā, kia korua. Thank you very much for coming in to put it all with us today. Appreciate Thank that. Uh, I think we'll, what we'll do now, councillors, is we'll just do the e-petition and then we'll have morning tea after. So we have um, Nick Johnston here um, to present the e-petition to us. <laughs> um, no mind, Nick. Um, so, Nick, you've got five minutes just to talk to us about the e-petition and then um, when you go and sit back down, Councillor Condi will... Um, move the petition to be accepted by councillors. Excellent. Thank you. I push it off. Excellent. Kia ora koutou. Uh, my name is Nick Johnstone. I'm here today because I was lucky enough this year to develop a new passion. Uh, in around mid-year, I purchased an Ubco 2x2, which is a New Zealand-produced electric motorcycle made uh, in Tauranga. They're designed for use on farms primarily, but they're also seeing a lot of uptick amongst um, people who are interested in electric vehicles and the army, and Domino's is also delivering pizzas out of Kandala on them now. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. Anyway, it introduced me to this whole new world of buying lots of expensive motorcycle gear and enjoying Wellington's weather in all sorts of different ways. Um, and I found this community of people in Wellington who are really excited about motorcycles. And what kind of stood out to me is that um, there's so many different ways of getting around the city and a lot of them are really impersonal. I'm sure you've heard it before, but motorcycles really become a passion for people. Um, we have beautiful roads in Wellington, we have beautiful scenery, and in many ways a motorcycle is the best way to enjoy our incredibly narrow, windy, hilly roads. Um, unfortunately, Wellington has a really bad problem, and that is motorcycle theft in the central city. Now, I um, personally know at least three or four people who have had their motorcycle stolen in broad daylight from public streets in Wellington, and when I posted on the Wellington Riders motorcycle group, uh, there were dozens more who wanted to share their stories. It's not uncommon to see a post every single week from someone, a couple of times, multiple posts per week from someone having their, their motorcycle stolen outside of, you know, to Papa or Lampton Key off the terrace. It's just, it's, it's really shocking. So I was looking around and the common recommendation from insurance companies is that if you are locking your bike up outside that you should install an anchor point on the ground. Um, they cost anywhere from sort of $50 to a couple of hundred dollars depending on the quality but you know obviously can be purchased in bulk and an anchor point is just something that gets screwed into the ground with a, a li large screw and then you can attach a lock to it like you would lock up a normal bicycle. Uh, so yeah, that's effectively why I'm here, is to ask the council to consider options for potentially making a um, small scale investment and in providing additional security for motorcycle parking in the central city. 
Um, those of you who have read the agenda today will have seen that the council staff's comments were that um, it would be best to approach the police for statistics about the rate of crime and potentially trial um, installing anchor points or another option at hotspots throughout the city where it seems like it would be most likely to be effective. Um, I'm here to echo the comments of the council officer, um, very much in line with my own. And yeah, it's, I know it might seem like a niche point. I appreciate, you know, the amount of time that it's taking for me to share this all with you. But I think as part of our push to try and get Wellington moving again, a large part of that is about recognising the value of having a diverse set of transportation options available that can fit individual people's needs. And motorcycles have been demonstrated to reduce congestion in cities. Um, they can reduce environmental impact, especially if you know, you're using an electric motorcycle. And they're just a great time. Um, yeah, that's everything I have to say. If you have any questions, please. Kia ora, Nick, and um, we do have a couple of partai. No, uh, Councillor Sparrow. Yeah, thanks very much for that. Even if these were to be installed, obviously they couldn't be installed everywhere. But my question is, how do many motorcyclists, I mean, I've done motorcycling in my time, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually have one in my garage right now. Um, in terms of motorcyclists carrying their own big um, block and chain sort of thing, is that feasible or do many do that? Or can that be used? Yeah, I, I think it is totally feasible. The main issue right now is that there's nowhere reliable to actually lock your bike up. Like if you use the official car parks, your best bet is there might be a lamppost and that means you're running a heavy chain across the gutter where a pedestrian might step down to avoid something, trip over it. It's just all, it's just a series of bad decisions effectively. Um, I personally, when I know I'm going somewhere that I can lock my bike up, I will just chuck a chain in one of my panniers and it's easy, you know easy enough to do um, for, you know, when you're spending seven, eight thousand dollars on a motorcycle, it makes sense to spend another hundred dollars on a chain and a lock sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I think it, it would be something that's quite practical and with some of these designs you can even repurpose sort of bike locks or the U locks depending on how it's configured. And we've got a part I from Councillor Free. Mine was just about generally speaking, are there enough motor places to park your motorbikes? We've had these conversations before but I'm interested in your feedback. Um, I would say that there is limited availability. I think the council's own numbers indicate there's four to 5,000 people trying to contest 1,500 parks every day, which, you know, isn't very good. Uh, the one thing I'll say in my four seconds remaining is that the community has pleaded me not to do anything to get motorcycle parking to cost money. So please, <laughs> if you're going to choose between free parking or making them more secure, I would be remiss to, you know. Thank you. <laughs> Kia ora, Nick. Thank you very much. You've been very clear. Thank you for your time. Appreciate that. Um, so I'm now going to invite Councillor Condi to introduce the report. Kia ora, thank you, and thank you, Nick, for that presentation. It was fantastic. Um, you know, it's it's definitely a theme that we know when we were doing the parking policy. We had a lot of submissions about motorcycle parking and the pressures on motorcycle parking. Um, and, you know, there was some consideration in that policy around charging, so we understand that that's a controversial issue in the community. Um, <laughs> And, but really one of the things that, that's a, that that was about, we heard a lot about um, wanting to have better infrastructure as well, about safety and being able to lock your bike up. And it's something that if you think about, we're hearing a lot about e-bikes now as well. When, when you're making a significant investment in these, in these things, then you know, people want to know that they can store them securely. So we really appreciate you bringing this petition, Nick. And um, you know, the first step obviously for us is to, is to get more data and that's, that's staff are working with, with the police um, to try and to try and do that, and if, if it, and it may be that we need to work a bit more directly with the community to get to get good data about the, the scale of this problem and, and where the hotspots are, so that we can look at doing some trials. Um, so we look forward to following that work with officers and, and seeing where where trials might might be. Um, we, not, we understand, obviously, that, that you know, um, changes to p motorcycle parking will be controversial, but that is a, a point where we might be able to roll this out more um, expansively across the city. Um, beyond just being able to do some trials to get a handle on this, this issue at the moment. So that's kind of the work program ahead of us. Um, and we really appreciate you, you, all of the effort because putting together a petition and, and you know, gathering up all the signatures and coming in today is a lot of effort. So we appreciate that, that you've taken the time to do that mahi to bring this to our attention. And I move this paper. 
Um, kia ora, uh, Councillor Fitzsimons, you're going to second? Would you like to speak to it? Yes, I'm very happy to second, and I just want to um, applaud your enthusiasm for bringing this and uh, really reflect that, um, as you'll see in the paper, you've already made a difference because council officers are in touch with the police and discussing this and trying to um, get to the bottom of it. And there's even a commitment in there um, that if data confirms that there is a significant problem, it will be appropriate to trial low-cost solutions at hotspots. So, um, and I just think it's a really cool thing about local government that people can put forward a petition and then our council officers go back and give you actually a, a meaningful outcome. So um, if by chance that uh, you don't see this continue to um, have some energy around it and you don't see the solutions that you are wanting, um, please don't give up because sometimes just keeping on putting a little bit of pressure on will get the change that you want. So yeah, thank you. Kia ora. Um, councillors, is there any further debate on this paper? No, and then so there's no need to write a reply, so we will vote. You want to speak, yeah, Councillor Foon? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> She's all right. I want to yeah, thank you for coming in to present. I, I really um, appreciate that you've found a love for a New Zealand um, designed and made business as well. That's really exciting. Um, but what I do want to do is val you know talk about the validation of parking and how and providing good parking spaces does make a difference. So being an electric bike rider like just our little Grey Street bicycle park makes a huge difference to the encouraging an alternative use of transport. So I just yeah, just wanted to acknowledge that it does make a difference. So thank you. Kia ora, thank you for that. So we will now vote. <laughs> so that's carried unanimously. And we will now break for morning tea and we'll come back at 5 to 11. Kia ora.
Away. Uh, so I'd like to um, invite Councillor Rush to introduce the item 3.1 sewage sludge minimisation paper. Uh, thank you, Madam, Ch Madam Chair. Um, and, and thank you very much to those who presented earlier today. Um, it, it's without doubt this has uh, got a huge community um, um, interest. And, uh, and there's a very good reason for that. We talk um, admiringly about infrastructure such as the library and the two or three thousand people who use it every day, but Moore Point is used by hundreds of thousands of people. <laughs> Everyone, including all those folks who come in from outside of Wellington as well. So it's great to see, um, as a consequence of my predecessor, Councillor Panett's um, vision, uh, this. Uh, issue be raised earlier rather than later. But I don't want to overstate this agenda item. We are simply being updated as to progress and where Wellington and Water have got to in regard to options. Um, this is simply good practice for us as governors so that we don't get a fait accompli at some other point further on down the track. And there will be a community consultation uh, quite what the nature will be, I'm not sure, but uh, just to alleviate the concerns that were raised earlier, um, bringing um, the community with us on this journey is the sound way uh, to get community buy-in. So for today, we've been presented with a preferred option, and that's all it is at this point in time. Um, it is a 21st century solution. Uh, a sustainable solution, a low emitting solution. And it does provide the potential to recover the resource. There have been some amendments made um, overnight, and I'd like to thank my colleague, Councillor Foon, for spearheading most of these. And they do actually respond to some of the issues raised today. Firstly, uh, we have asked, and officers have agreed to release the uh, concept design paper that's been mentioned, and any other um, information uh, that the public w wishes to see in this process, I will personally make sure it's made available. Um, I have nothing to lose but credibility in this uh, project, <laughs> and I don't like losing my credibility. Um, oh, it's lost. Um, and what, what we really wanted also to do is to um, make uh, to steer what comes to us um, in this project so that we get a more granular um, analysis, including cost benefit, including what are the op other options? What, what about the most green option? What about the status quo? We want to understand exactly what we're spending our money on, what else could we be spending our money on, and what's going to give us the most benefit. So, and officers have agreed to that, of course. So, as I, as I say, I don't want to overstate the significance of this paper. It's simply an update. We've got more to come, and, uh, and it's something to really look forward to, and when it does come, I will be um, more fulsome in my description and summary. But for now, I'd like to thank uh, particularly officers, uh, Wellington Water, who I'm finding a, a pleasure to work with and I know who have made great strides in their community engagement, and their contractors, particularly Becker, Councillor Panett, and of course, Councillor Foon. Um, and I guess one other thing that I've learned in the water space is the approach of mana whenua in this space. And I suppose it would not be out of order to provide a thank you to mana whenua. Kia ora. Uh, and I understand Councillor Foon is seconding. Would you like to speak to it now? Uh, kia ora. Yes. Um, as you'll all know, that working toward a waste-free Wellington is a small passion of mine. Um, <laughs> Since I have been on the council, um, the way we treat our sludge is the reason that I and many other waste-free advocates is the reason why we are being told we can't really go on that journey right now. 
So um, I do just want to thank Councillor Sean Rush for your collaborative approach uh, to me, but also to the community and being available to talk whenever we've needed. Um, and I also really want to thank Wellington Water for the, the great work that you've done and, and just understanding that this is the next stage in the process. I also want to thank you for working with Mana Whenua as this is um, their wisdom and knowledge and view is critical to the way we go forward. Um, as Sean, as Councillor Rush has said, we know that this is part way on a long journey of finding the best solution for Wellington. Um, and, but our, our amendments today just reflect that we want to be more concise, that we do want more confidence that we are taking the people of Wellington and those in the local communities affected with us that we do want more confidence that we are showing a long-term thinking and the impact that this will have on our landfill, the model and long-term waste reduction and carbon reduction goals. And that we do more, want more confidence that we can show that we are going or have gone and will be still going through a robust, robust process to get to the best outcome. I really uh, just want to remind us all that there is no way and that our community has this, we've given them this idea that every time things magically disappear when we fl turn on a tap, flush a toilet or put a rubbish bag out on the street. And th this is an opportunity to get our community involved in understanding that and the behaviour that we need to change and the opportunity that we have um, ahead of us. And I do want you to know that at the heart of everything we do, that thank you to our community that came to present to us this morning, because at the heart of everything that they do is about protecting our taonga, our environment, tapu teranga, and the order of Ofero stream, and that, that is why we are all here today. So kia ora, I will be proudly seconding this paper. Kia ora, uh, Councillor Matthews. Kia ora koutou. Um, I'd also like to thank my councillor colleagues, um, Councillor Rush and Councillor Foon, for their leadership on this issue, uh, Wellington Water and officers. Um, I just want to briefly speak to the community engagement aspect. And um, I do think uh, that there's been a lot of calls from the community for us to try sort of new and innovative, innovative ways of um, working through community concerns and coming up with solutions together. I think this is an ideal opportunity to, to try some new methods perhaps a sort of a, a, a shortened citizens assembly or something like that in this process. So I will be raising that with officers um, myself, that this is a, a good opportunity for us to use something a little bit different to have a deeper conversation with those especially local affected communities about this issue. Councillor Fitzsimons. Yeah, I just want to um, join in with colleagues in thanking uh, officers from Wellington Water and from the council for the work on this, and of course my councillor colleagues, uh, Councillor Rush and Councillor Foon. Um, it became really clear late last year that water infrastructure in Wellington was in crisis uh, and that we needed to make difficult and important decisions for the future. This work is urgent and necessary for our whole city it's really clear that we need a new and modern approach to reducing sludge going to landfill. I want to acknowledge the residents of the South Coast and Moa Point who have been incredibly patient with this council and with Wellington Water, but we know their patience has limits and all Wellington residents deserve much better than the current approach. I do have some concerns about this project. I'm concerns, concerned about um, the project management of it, given the experiences of cost blowouts on the Omororo Reserve. And I will, um, as this project develops, ask for and uh, require really detailed commitments to containing costs and risk management. And I do maintain concerns around the contracting out model of core infrastructure, which I don't think serves our city well. We are, as a city, having really important discussions about growth. We know that more people will come to live in Wellington, 
and many residents have raised concerns with me, and they're valid concerns, about the need for infrastructure upgrades to manage existing residents, but also growth. And I see this as one part of addressing uh, their concerns. I also just want to um, particularly acknowledge um, Ofiro Bay Residents Association and um, just note that, can we just scroll up to point five? Um, that Councillor Foon and Councillor Rush did um, add in, that particularly with local communities because of your submission here today. So hopefully you take that as some indication that this council's already taking a step to listening to you, but obviously that's just the start of that conversation and we need to do it. And I guess um, I just, in my view, we can be the council which takes historic steps to invest in the core infrastructure of our city, and I'll certainly be supporting uh, all steps in that direction. Kia ora, Deputy Mayor Free. Yeah, look, um, I think this is probably one of the most important issues facing our city, to be really honest. It's very fundamental as how we actually deal with our waste and I don't think it's a light decision. And clearly the order of magnitude of cost is quite similar to the library and other decisions that we've um, sought quite a long and robust process over. So my preference would really be that we do not just deal with this through the long-term plan, but that we actually deal with it through its own process. I think it does deserve a genuinely robust look um, and a very um, holistic look at how this um, affects our city, because as much as transport, this is actually going to be a city's shaping project in its own right. So um, the decisions we make here, like for example, does uh, any future infrastructure get located at the landfill, or does it get located in the eastern suburbs? Or, um, you know, we've got western suburbs involvement as well, um, with the um, alternative waste water treatment plant, the smaller one that we've got up in Karori. So I have a lot of questions, and I'm glad to see quite a lot listed there and uh, that will come back to us for further discussion through a workshop process. But this is very fundamental. We do have to get this right. The amount of money is quite large, and we won't be doing it again. So we, it is an investment literally for um, the next 30 to 40 years. Um, my question's really sort of, so what, as part of this, I think we need to actually ask what is the long-term future of the landfills valley? What, what is actually going to happen there long-term? How long, how, what sort of time frame are we looking at for that? You know, the Mount Albert Tunnel, how robust is that? Is that actually so fragile, as we've seen, and it can be fragile, but is it so fragile going forwards that that really needs to be a big part of our decision making? You know, are there other ways we could manage this through a more distributed solution rather than a centralised solution? Um, there, there really are a lot of questions. We need to talk about the wider waste story because if we're spending this money to reduce the sludge with the expectation that that can be part of a, a waste minimisation strategy, then what does that actually look like? How are we going to put into, into pro play some steps that will incentivise that going forwards and make sure that's part of the part of the um, you know the the outcomes that we can achieve? So my biggest plea here is that we do give this the status that it, that it deserves as a very significant decision for our city and not just try to lump it in with um, the long-term plan process. Kia ora, Councillor Pennant. Uh, kia ora, so thank you for um, all the speeches. I'd like to thank the public um, whose attitudes are definitely changing and that's fantastic because it's giving support uh, to those of us who want to change things. Um, thank you to the staff at Wellington Water too and uh, City Council. As I said, one of the best meetings I've ever been to is talking about the beneficial use of sludge. Um, the thinking is definitely um, starting to change, which is fantastic. And thank you for your leadership, um, Councillors Rush and Foon. Um, look, I stand by the fact that I brought this project forward in the last uh, long-term plan in 2018. The way it was configured originally was that it was in the never-never, sort of, you know, year 14. Well, that was hopeless. This was a part of a big drive to, to actually start to transition the way that we deal with waste, and it had, to, um, it had to happen. But just remembering that this is part of a much bigger story around resource recovery at the southern landfill rather than, than it being a dump, um, and dealing with our organics. And there is money in there for business cases, Councillor Condi, $400,000 worth of business cases to, to look at how we deal with organics and, and how we transition to having a resource recovery centre. The 2017 plan was mentioned today. Look, it was a good start, but, you know, obviously 
our thinking has changed and we were acting regionally. Um, also, we are somewhat uh, curtailed in our aspirations because until things change nationally, the waste levy going up, a container deposit uh, scheme, until there's product stewardship, um, the city is rather limited. So, you know, from my perspective, the system is incredibly broken and we have had numerous debates at this council around whether it is broken. My view, you know, obviously it is. We're one of the worst per, uh, performers in, in the OECD. So I just want to just put that in that context that the sludge is only a first start and that I have said many times that we cannot wait until later to deal with the infrastructure, to deal with the organics or other resources. Um, the argument from some has been that we have to deal with the sludge first and then we'll deal with everything else later, but that's just actually too long. We have to make the transition and we have to spend the money now. Um, the circular economy, thank goodness, it's becoming mainstream and um, talking to Councillor Foon about how we um, get those ideas within council architecture and that um, we've actually been given permission to start thinking about what a circular economy framework would look like, which we will design with the community rather than um, just coming from uh, one particular place. I look forward to future workshops because there is a lot of uh, questions to answer. Um, look, I don't want to go too much into the cost blowout issue because, you know, I, but I did ask some questions yesterday and have a number of conversations. Um, you know, it has been a bit frustrating that we were told, you know, this was going to cost this much and this much, and then, you know, the process was is that they started, the costs weren't accurate. And I took that in good faith. Um, so I guess there's just something to learn from that. Um, also, it might be all very well to sort of say how bad things are now, but can I just remind you that the context was that the rates were supposed to be at around 3%. People would scream if they went any um, higher. Um, that um, you know that uh, Wellington Water only started managing projects in the last three years, so they they were only doing the management, and now they're doing some project management. So Councillor Fitzsimons, I think your point is absolutely valid, but you know there were obviously were some teething problems and some things to learn, and I'm sure that things are being learned, um, and that's fantastic. Um, just uh, last point is that I love the idea of the community co-design. We need to be doing that in a lot of other things. The mana whenua obviously need to be, and it's good that they've been included because this is critical. The whole argument around decentralisation, which, you know, it's great that there's actually support from that from different parts of the political spectrum because the costs are just too high. Like, it's just going to cost us billions of dollars and we don't have billions of dollars. Unless we get a bailout from government, we can't do um, all of I look forward, uh, I have asked Mr Williams to organise a meeting again, to talk about the infrastructure strategy. It's probably the most important document that we will work on, this triennium actually, to make sure that we get all of those costs and issues and costs of not taking action because we are so behind on waste that we are going to run into real problems in 10 years unless we transition fast. But thank you, and it's a good step forward, and it will be great to see us come to a, um, a really great solution ultimately. Thank you, Councillor O'Neill. Good councillors. I just very briefly wanted to start by acknowledging the work of uh, residents at Federal Bay Stream um, as well, and, and in particular the work of councillors uh, Foon, Simons, Rush and Hannett for bringing this sort of um, these really large waste issues to the council table. And I, the reason I acknowledge um, the Oferdal Bay residents is even before I was on council, they they tend to have been um, a really strong hold for, for voice in the regenerative um, regenerative economy and particularly bringing things to light such as the, um, the health of the natural environment and the streams down in that area and how, and to acknowledge how deeply affected the, um, the residents both at Moore Point and of or Fiddle Bay have been dealing with uh, waste as well like that, as um, as my other ward councillors will know, being in the eastern suburbs, um, but but likely neighbours in, in the um, southern suburbs as well, waste and wastewater and the way that we deal with uh, cross-contamination and our beaches has long been a pretty big local issue. Um, uh, the number one for number twos is that we minimise waste going to landfill and find more regenerative ways to handle 
um, this going forward. And I'm particularly really excited to see a lot of the ambitions and considerations in this paper. Earlier in the week, um, we had a really extensive question time around um, what this what this means for the um, for the way that we manage our food basket and our gardens and opportunities around uh, improving. Um, the way that we handle waste and its uh, relationship to the natural environment as well. And just briefly to acknowledge um, how how awesome it is to have a paper like this come to, to council table and be so forward thinking and to already see that proactive engagement with residents taking place as well. And I'll, I'll leave it there, but otherwise I'm, I'm very excited to see um, where this takes us and um, and to talk more about poo, uh, this is something you know. It's it's a pretty unique opportunity that we have at council to to um, to have a corridor around such an awesome, popular thing in Wellington. Um, and I'll leave it there. Kia ora, uh, Councillor Condi. Kia ora. Yeah, I was thinking I, I haven't talked as much about poo since my kids were quite a bit smaller than they are now. Um, <laughs> since I became a city councillor. Um, just wanted to talk all the comments around waste, but I'm going to spend my time nerding out a little bit and talking about costs and, and the cost modelling and acknowledging that we've, you know, we've seen some, some cost escalation and, and the, just trying to acknowledge the work that's been done around that. So, you know, we've, we've talked about Omororo, the costs increased significantly from the LTP figure, and then again this project, you know, the cost the, in the LTP there was $30 million. This cost has come in at significantly higher than that. Um, kind of deep breath higher than that. So it's... The, I want to acknowledge the, the awesome, fantastic work that's happening um, at Council and at Wellington Water to, to better on this going forward. We can't change what, the, what number was put in the long-term plan three years ago. That was done, but we can change how we operate going forward. And um, that this is the first project that the Wellington Water are now using their new cost modelling um, framework for us to, so that they can give us um, a really clear indication about where the project is at and what the price is. And the best way I can think to explain this to people is, is really around, um, you know, we, we were extending a house. So if you're building a house, you go to the, the architect and you say, I want to build a house, how much it's going to cost? And the architect says, I don't know, how big a house do you want to build? And he says, I don't know yet. <laughs> um, then it's kind of hard for the architect to give you a clear idea about how much a house is going to cost. It's like, well, if it's a small house, it might cost $300,000. If it's a really big house, there's one going up in part of Wellington that's like $7 million. So there's a range for you, $300,000 to $7 million. Um, and that's really kind of where we're at, where we have to put a, a number into the long-term plan a lot of the time, is that we're in a cost range of $300,000 to $7 million. <laughs> And so we, we, we're doing a lot of work with um, our new CFO and, and the infrastructure strategy about how we handle that and putting the range in and thinking about how we deal that. And Wellington Water's done a lot of work about that as well show, to give us a clear indication about when they're giving us a cost estimate, how far along is the project? How confident are they in that estimate? Where are we at with that? And when the project is quite early in its stages, so perhaps you've gone to the architect and you said, okay, I think I want a five bedroom house and, and I think we've got some artists' impressions of what it might look like, um, that you still have a lot of contingency in that. You've, you've, you've gotten closer to what it is that you're talking about, but maybe there's still 50% contingency and it's only as you get closer and closer to having you know, actual concept designs and then you get the detailed drawings that you could actually give to a builder and the builder looks at those and says, okay, this is what I think it's gonna cost. That as you hone in on that, you get much more accurate with the costs. And I wanna acknowledge that Wellington Water's doing you know, great work and being really clear with governors now about where the cost estimate is, how much confidence we can have in it and how much contingency is being built into it. Um, and acknowledge that this is the first project that is being put through that um, cost framework. And so that we as governors ha um, have been told by the chief executive that he is confident in terms of this as a level two estimate, the amount of contingency that's in it, and that we've been really um, given a clear guide about, about the range that, um, that these costs are sitting in. And how much I appreciate that the work that they've done in that area to, to move forward. And then acknowledge the work um, you know, Mr. Williams is doing in setting up the project management office, which is gonna do a lot of really great work in-house to make sure that as we manage these project going through the pipeline that we are confident about making sure we stay on the costs um, as we move forward. So I think there's a lot of really great work happening, um, even though you know I understand to the public and certainly to councillors sometimes it's um, frustrating and a bit of a surprise when the costs go up like that. Um, but we're not sitting, sitting back and saying, oh, well, that's just how things are. There's a lot of work happening 
um, with, within Wellington Water and within the City Council um, to get a lot better at this and so that when we deliver the lo our long-term plan um, in the middle of next year that we will um, be delivering something for the future councillors that hopefully they won't be in the same situation of having some um, unexpected surprises as much as we can do. So I just wanted to talk to all of that work that's happening um, and just have a little rant about costs for a while. Kia ora. Kia ora. Um, so under um, Standing Order 20.3, um, we have had more than three speakers in favour. So are there any to the contrary? <laughs> Otherwise, we'll go to the right of reply. No to the contrary? OK. Um, <laughs> Councillor Rush, you can do your right of reply. Not that there's much to reply to. but Yeah, I, I'll keep it very quick. Thank you, uh, colleagues, um, for your messages of support and recognising some concerns validly raised. And thank you, Councillor Condi, for reminding us that there is a project management team that's been set up that will be headed uh, by... by um, uh, Mr. Williams, um, which will um, hopefully give some reassurance. And I'd also like to say that in my time with Wellington Water, um, they have delivered, um, you know, the the fixing of the sludge pipelines over a pandemic um, with uh, crews being flying in on time and on budget um, was a shock to me, actually, but a pleasant one. Um, I do also look forward to the wider infrastructure strategy and also um, I am minded also that this should be subject to a separate consultation, but I will take officer advice on that at the time. Um, I think, Councillor Panett, you mentioned Mana Whenua. I think there, I, I would like to think that there is more than just a consultation role here for Mana Whenua, but more of a partnership um, in the financial sense. So um, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Um, and of course, private sector uh, and, and, and possibly also government. And I also echo the um, thoughts around decentralisation, and that's why the amendment's been put up there to um, to bring that through. And yes, costs. Well, if there was one project which I could take to the city and say this is going to cost you money, I think this would be it. We simply need this. We simply cannot carry on as we are. Whatever it costs, it'll cost, but everybody will buy into it because we all need it. So that's all, thanks. Kia ora. So we are going to put that um, to the vote now. So please vote accordingly. Oh. It's unanimous. We can have a division, but yeah. I, yeah, it's, yeah, I think it's gonna be, the indications are that it will be unanimous. Except the deputy is having problems with their remote. <laughs> there we go, unanimous. Division recorded. <laughs> no division. Okay, we'd like to move on to item 3.2, uh, Draft Cemeteries Management Plan 2020, and would like to invite Councillor Fitzsimons to introduce the report. Yeah, thank you. Um, I do just want to start by um, uh, making a really genuine thanks to the officers who have worked on this. Um, there's, there's many of them, but particularly uh, Shona Mafanway, Elizabeth Reddington, and all of the people that work in our cemeteries, and Paul Andrews, because they do uh, an incredible job with bereaved families, and the feedback I've constantly got from residents uh, since since taking over the portfolio responsibility that includes residents is how sensitive and caring our staff are in accommodating uh, all sorts of different requests for, from bereaved families about how they would uh, like to uh, commemorate their loved ones and also um, how they would like to um, manage these issues in the future as a city. Uh, so I guess there is a statutory context to have this work. We as a council are required to plan for the future demand and we do have some major issues to address. Karori Cemetery is effectively full except for uh, people who will be um, already going into existing family plots there. Markata Cemetery will be full in 2038 for burials and 2048 for ash plots. So the, the issues are pressing. I just sort of touch on a few aspects um, 
in particularly that had come up on Tuesday and some of them are addressed in some of the amendments which are put forward as, as part of this and I'll touch on them as well. Uh, first of all, around decorations. This council I think has shown a really sensitive approach. These are um, what we're planning is a balance between really respecting bereaved families um, and balancing this with the need to ensure that council can properly maintain the space. There is some encouragement given of biodegradable materials, but um, a recognition that for many families, plastic will continue to be used and that this really isn't the right time to advance uh, a ban in this area, given um, that people are at, the, at, at a very vulnerable time when, when, they've, got a when they've suffered a bereavement. Um, the, the plan also includes a proposal that we would allow temporary ownership of a pot for a period of years. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done about that, there's not, it's not at all um, certain how that would work in practice. Details like the length of ownership, uh, how families could change their mind and how that intersects with the statutory context uh, all needs to be worked through. But we were advised on Tuesday that this is quite common in parts of Europe and Asia uh, and that any period between uh, 15 and 100 years is, is common. Obviously this needs to be handled with real sensitivity and it's very clear that there's no pressure on any bereaved families and it doesn't apply to existing plots, except where the deed might say otherwise. Um, on Tuesday, there were issues raised around videos on headstones um, and, and what, we, what we are planning there. This has become common overseas. So there is a, a clearer suggestion around making sure that we're, we're banning those because of the issues with disturbing other visitors, but also a power source and the, what happens to the batteries. Um, but, but on the other side, the um, inclusion of QR codes, which is apparently something that is developing a little bit at other cemeteries. We've got some incredible stories to tell about uh, people and animals that are buried in our cemeteries. Mrs Chippy the Cat is probably the most commonly visited grave in the Karori Cemetery. Um, and you can imagine the value of a of a QR code on that particular grave uh, for people and visitors who, who come to see that. Um, and I think as well the cemeteries management plan does a really good job of sensitively acknowledging that cemeteries are used for a range of activities, so including genealogy, uh, walking dogs, bird watching, meditation, picnicking, uh, cycling at 10 kilometres an hour. Um, but also that um, there are a number of groups who are very committed to our cemeteries and who do a lot of work in helping visitors uh, trace their families uh, and also uh, even school groups visiting Karori Cemetery. So I do want to um, give special, special acknowledgement to the Friends of Karori Cemetery who do an amazing amount of work and are looking actually at doing uh, more and, and our staff have been excellent at finding them, them places to operate from. So uh, I guess just to note that this is just a draft cemeteries management plan, that, that it's very important that we uh, take this into account in the long-term plan because there are, as the paper says, likely to be increased costs facing the city in order to uh, address increased demand. So yeah, I ask for your support for, for this draft cemeteries management plan, which will then go out for, for consultation and come back to us uh, after a series of public hearings early next year. Kia ora, and I understand this is being seconded by Councillor O'Neill. Kia ora, would you like to speak? Uh, no, happy to reserve my right to speak. Kia ora. Are there any further speakers to this paper? Councillor Pennett. Um, I would also like to thank staff. This is a really thorough paper. Um, I think um, clearly a lot of work's being done and um, that is much appreciated. Obviously the pre-engagement too, members of the public have helped out and people who are friends of the cemetery, um, that's really a really fantastic uh, job that you're doing. So I'd just like to uh, just discuss a few issues. I'm not going to raise any amendments, I'll just see what comes back from consultation. Um, I did see the issue of Urupa is, uh, is another issue of inequality. Um, I read an article in the newspaper just about usually Tangata Whenua are responsible for their own, whereas um, if you know if it's in, within council boundaries and that's paid for. So um, I definitely do want to see some equality brought in here that 
um, that uh, mana whenua aren't left with the costs and and all the responsibility where it's where it might be a burden. Um, so I think there's possibly room in the document maybe to make a a bit more progress there, but obviously we'll see what mana whenua say about that. But it, it is important that that people have equal rights um, in death as well as life. Um, as the Heritage Portfolio Leader, I'm glad Heritage was practically on every page of this document, thank you, um, that it was, um, that it is recognised as, as being very important and um, also has um, a wide interpretation of what heritage is. I really appreciate that. Uh, the decoration of graves, so this is something that actually does have personal impact on me, I, and so I hope I can sort of speak on behalf of people who do have, uh, who are in the active process of grieving. Um, I see that there is a, you know, there's a balance that's been tried to achieve, which I appreciate, but I think we need to have some more discussion. I do find the signs a bit insensitive at the cemetery. Um, you know, people do all sorts of things um, to make that site um, special, and I don't really want to get in the way of that. Um, I'm glad that the staff have raised broader issues around environmental sustainability. Um, you know, ultimately, how much land do we need? Um, but obviously it is a sensitive issue, and I think that the document deals with that issue really, really well, um, that obviously there should be no pressure to, um, you know, to reuse plots and all that sort of thing, but I think it's fair enough to raise. Um, I did raise a question around the children's and young persons area, obviously incredibly sensitive area, and so I would um, be very supportive of investing there to make sure that that is a special place um, for families, because that, of course, is the ultimate tragedy when, when young people are lost. So um, that would be really important. Um, I think the issue of maintenance, I appreciate staff raising that too, yeah, because families will only have a certain sort of lifetime when they do do that maintenance when it's practical. Um, and so obviously we need to make future provision for that um, because it's, it's just not realistic to expect people to look after things for 100 years or more. And then the, just the last issue around recreation, look, I'm a bit, you know, Yes, maybe there can be some, but I think we have to be really careful, and I possibly would like to see some stronger wording around um, making sh really, really clear that this is a place for remembrance, not for taking your bike. Interesting that apparently you can bike in 10K in a cemetery, but not scooter <laughs> on, a, on a footpath in, in the central city. That's, that's all kind of interesting about um, balance, but I do think there are some uh, issues there, and also I know that I've had uh, past engagement with uh, Kahurori and uh, the dog owners there, and that they did want some space to exercise their dogs, and probably this isn't the right place, but then, you know, how do we make provision elsewhere, because I think that's really important. So I think, look, again, staff have done a really great job, and it will be um, important to make sure that we get lots of feedback from a wide range of people um, to make the document even stronger. Thank you. Kia ora. Um, I'm just going to make a few um, quick comments. I'd like to also acknowledge the fact that this was an excellent report, really good to read, really um, thorough and a level of information. Um, and just want to acknowledge too, thank you, Councillor Panet, for your um, comments around equity and um, with regards to the Urupa. Um, I've had direct feedback from Mana Whenua that they've really appreciated the support from Council staff over the last few weeks and months trying to um, work through some of the challenges and the issues. Um, when. Uh, when your land is alienated and you have to re-find uh, re your place, um, that's not easy and it's great that our staff are working with mana whenua to um, establish how that can work um, in Karori. And I also just want to acknowledge um, the comments from Councillor Matthews on Tuesday about the opportunity possibly to look at the renaming of um, Karori Cemetery to Kaharori um, and that is something I think we should have a um, conversation with mana whenua about. Um, I think it is really important that we do have our names recorded correctly and that's uh, um, one way that we can make a change um, to show we acknowledge um, how sometimes our um, past isn't recorded correctly, so it's something that we can do as a council. Um, but yeah, thank you very much and thank you um, Councillor Fitzsimons for your enthusiastic leadership on this. Um, I think it goes back to you having a photo up at the cemetery, enthusiastically going and having a look around. So hopefully the rest of us can go and have a look around at some stage soon um, and the weather is better to us so that we can do that. Uh, Mayor Foster. It was a fake, fake hand. Um, Councillor Foon. 
Um, kia ora tato. Just a brief one from me. I really want to thank the, the team for um, a great um, draft policy to take out to the public. Very proud of Wellington City f for this. But I, I do want to acknowledge the work that you've done on the environmental sustainability, the the general sustainability and looking at low carbon options and how we can maybe be the first uh, zero carbon cemetery in the country. So I really support you to, to go on that journey if you would like. Kia ora. Thank you. Kia ora. So um, understanding what is 20.3, we have now had three speakers in favour. Is there anyone to the contrary? No. So we'll go to our right of reply. Oh, um, did Councillor O'Neill want to speak because you did? No. Yes. Uh, Councillor Fitzsimons, do you have a rush? I, I don't really have anything to say except to thank um, colleagues for their feedback and, and we'll look forward to obviously hearing from the funeral director community and other residents. Great. OK, let's vote. OK, so that is unanimous. All right, thank you. We are now going to move into public exclu excluded, excluded. Um, officers recommend that the public is excluded from the following part of the proceedings of the motion uh, for, the, for this meeting, um, and the motion has been set out. Um, so I'll move that motion. Do I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Sparrow, thank you. And is there any debate? Uh, uh, Councillor Fennett? Please. When is the information being released? Do we have an answer to that? Everybody's busy. There's a, there's a question about when... So, Councillor Panna, on completion of the deal, the information will be released. No, that's a very valid question. Okay, so I'm now going to put this to the vote. Okay, so that is carried unanimously. And we'll just wait to make sure that we are offline, but that we don't.